This is an emergency. I'll have to ask you to stay here for now. Everything's arranged, and nobody will disturb you. I'm sorry, but this isn't something I need your help with. Leave this one to me. An emergency? How bad is it? Nahida, will you be okay? Don't worry. If my assessment is correct, though there may be some minor disturbances, it won't lead to a disaster. Please rest and recover your strength here until I say it's safe. Her voice is gone. Paimon can't shake the feeling that something really big has happened. What do you think the Balladeer meant? And why did he suddenly grab onto you before? He wants to change the past? But surely that's impossible! Right! You can't just rewrite history! All that stuff happened already in real life! It's like... Um... Imagine Paimon drank all the water in this inn. Even if no one was there to see it, Paimon would sure as heck remember drinking it! Hmm... So... Why does Paimon still have a bad feeling about this? Paimon can't help but feel scared about what he might do. Ooh, Paimon's so confused. Huh? Ah! Sorry, Paimon accidentally... Oh. Oh. It's the Balladeer's fault for causing Paimon all this mental stress. But erasing yourself from history? It's unthinkable. Is that... Really possible in Ermansoul? Uh-oh. Paimon's head is overheating from trying to understand what he's up to. And it's still not working. Paimon's had it with that little brat. He's been nothing but trouble ever since we met him. There's no way he'll actually succeed, right? Otherwise, won't everyone who's connected to him be affected too? we can do about it at this point. Hey, have you got any ideas on what we should do next? Seems like now there's nothing left for us to do but to go to sleep. But Paimon's still so worried. Paimon won't be able to sleep a week tonight. So, how about... Uh, we list all our favorite foods to take our mind off things. Heck, if that doesn't work, Paimon's probably gonna collapse of anxiety here. Alright, Paimon will start. First dish. Hmm. Munstack grilled fish. Oh, and chicken mushroom skewers. Tea break pancakes, cream stew, sauteed matsutake, and drain chili chicken, almond tofu, satisfying salad. Oh, oh, also, Adeptus Temptation, Golden Shrimp Balls, Triple Layered Consomme, Lotus Seed and Bird Egg Soup, and... And... Um... Um... Hmm? Uh, hmm. Uh... What do we... What was Paimon supposed to be doing just now? Paimon was... um... talking? Huh. Paimon suddenly can't remember what she was talking about. What was it again? Hmm? The Balladeer? Is that a food too? Huh. Weird name though. What's wrong? Your eyes are like saucers. Was it something Paimon said? So, the Balladeer. Is that someone's name? Cause it sounds like a nickname or something. Hmm? Okay, sure! Where are we going? Huh? Fine by Paimon. 
understand, but is everything okay? You're acting like this is an emergency. It's been a while. Of course. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> now there's a question I wasn't expecting. <sighs> Very well. I'll tell you what I know once more. The once renowned Raiden Gokuden, comprised of five branches Aminoma, Futsu, Ishin, Hyakume, and Senju. The art of forging practiced by these five clans was first taught to them personally by the almighty Shogun. Over time, the five branches diverged from one another as generations of bladesmiths honed and perfected their craft until they became five distinct traditions. Most of the great swordsmith clans of old have since fallen into decline, and for a long time, only the Amenoma branch kept its heart alive. But fortunately, Kaedahara Kazuha recently returned to Inazuma and took up the mantle of the Ishin art. Now, two clans remain of the original Gokuden Five. If my memory serves me right, you yourself were present when he forged the Ishin blade. Oh yeah, we were! Paimon remembers that now! We learned a bit about the decline of the Raiden Gokuden then, too. It seems like such a shame. <sighs> that, my friends, is a tragic tale indeed. In fact, this was not made known to me for most of my life. All these years, I knew of those great clans' demise, but never the cause. <sighs> Only recently, when the question was on my mind, did I ask Kaedehara Kazuha about this? He told me that, as we are both heirs to a branch of the Raiden Gokunen, it was right that I should know the truth. There is no harm in telling you, but I must warn you. It is a dark and sorrowful tale. The Raiden Gokunen were the targets of a murderous rampage by a vengeful bladesmith. Vengeful? Why? Four hundred years ago, so I'm told, there was a catastrophic malfunction in Tatarasuna's furnace. One brave swordsmith heard the commotion and chose not to flee, but he rushed to the scene, hoping to prevent a disaster. Tatarasuna was home to a state-of-the-art forging and smelting operation in that day and overseeing it was the armory officer. His surname was Niwa, though he had family ties to the Kaedehara clan. Knowing that they had just one chance to save countless lives, Mr. Niwa and the swordsmith leaped together into the furnace. The furnace quickly stabilized, but <sighs> neither of them made it out. The smith's death, though heroic, dealt a devastating blow to his family's fortunes. His orphan son was left to fend for himself and grew up deeply resentful at the world. In his heart, the whole of Inazuma was culpable in his tragedy. He hated the almighty Shogun for her apparent indifference towards his father's death, and he hated everyone who had done nothing to try and save him. Powerless and destitute, the only legacy he had to pass on to his children was his hatred. Generation after generation bore this grudge, 
living in utter misery. Alas, if only the story could have ended there. But 100 years ago, the then head of this family reached the end of his wits. He could bear their fate no longer, and yet he could do nothing to change it. Finally, he made a drastic decision to take revenge on the ride in Gokuden. In doing so, he sought to vent his pet up anger and shake the very foundations of Inazuma's forging industry. In his fury, he murdered indiscriminately, killing even bladesmiths from the Hyakume clan which he belonged to. His goal was absolute, the devastation of all of the Raiden Gokuden. But when he came to the Kaedehara and Kamisato clans, his killing spree came to an abrupt end. He failed to catch them unawares. They fought back fiercely, and they did not spare his life. That is why the Kaedehara clan and their Ishin art survived that day. I suppose they were the lucky ones, under the dire circumstances. Was there anything else you wanted to ask? Kazuha? Why, yes. Just yesterday, in fact. We spoke for a while over some tea. He seemed well. My pleasure. Don't tell Paimon. There are other places you want to visit too, right? <laughs> Your expression says it all. You can't hide anything from Paimon. On to the next stop. Lead the way, traveler. Paimon will be right behind you. Behold! world is We're here! Um, this is the Yashiro Commission's headquarters, so... Traveler, it's been a while. If you're looking for the Commissioner and Miss Kamisato, I'm afraid your timing is unfortunate. They're not here right now. Are they out on business? The Commissioner is out on business. And Miss Kamisato is standing in for some meetings in the Commissioner's place. If it's urgent, you're welcome to wait inside until they get back. What do you think? Shall we go in? If it were anyone else, I couldn't allow it. But seeing as you're so close with the Commissioner and Miss Kamisato, I think it should be okay. We'll be heading in then. Hmm? Hello, dears. Is there something you want to say? <laughs> of course, Traveler. Yes, I know who you are. Miss Kamisato has told me about you. What would you like to know? Oh, they're both very well indeed. Lately, Miss Kamisato has been rather busy attending all kinds of meetings and occasionally paying visits to some local organizations on the Commissioner's behalf. As for the Commissioner himself, well, you know, busy as ever, that much hasn't changed. Although, he does seem to be in a rather good mood these days. So pretty much...
much business as usual on the Yashiro Commission, huh? Very much so. Well, got any more questions? You're very welcome. In fact, I would love nothing more than for you to come and visit more often. But I'm sure you must be far too busy to have time for that. Miss Kamisato talks about you all the time. She seems so thrilled to have you as a friend. And she's always saying how talented you are and how much she admires you. I must say, many things in Inazuma seem to have taken a turn for the better since you arrived here. So, you're not just Miss Kamisato's knight in shining armor, you know. You're a hero to us all. I mean it. Whenever the commissioner dines at home, Toma always joins him. I always find myself at my most relaxed when I'm serving the two of them and listening to them chat away. The Commissioner has such a busy schedule that he doesn't always have the chance to take his meals at home. But, given the opportunity, he always prefers to dine here. They say it's because Toma's a much better chef than most. <laughs> oh, the Commissioner is so fond of home comforts. They get to talking about you sometimes, too, you know. Always with a very fond tone. The way one would talk about dear old friends around whom one can truly be themselves. Miss Kamisato occasionally joins them as well. Whenever the whole family gets together and they start talking about people they've met and experiences they've had, you always get a mention. It's been many years now since the late Mr. and Mrs. Kamisato passed away. Much has happened in the Kamisato clan in that time. As someone who is old and gray enough to have watched their son and daughter grow up, it makes me so happy to see them meet a dependable friend whose company they enjoy so much. So, in the future, if you ever do have the time, please know you are always very welcome at the Yashiro Commission Headquarters. There will always be at least one old lady who would be delighted to have the pleasure of your company. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Haima likes it here too. Also, you were saying something about the food here being really great. Haima's itching to try it. We may just have to invite ourselves around for dinner sometime. Uh... Paimon meant we should come pay a visit again real soon. Ideally around dinner time. <laughs> of course. You're always welcome. Alright, goodbye for now. We're, uh... Where are we going next? Great! Goodbye, ma'am. Don't worry, we'll see ourselves out. Alright then. Take care now. Hope to see you soon. Oh, are you two leaving already? Yep, everything's taken care of now, don't worry. Very well, safe travels. Goodbye.
something or someone. Do my eyes deceive me, or is that the Traveler and Paimon? Xavier, what are you doing here? I was in the general area, and now I'm in this specific area. There, that's me. So what about you two? We have some questions and thought you might be able to help. Certainly do. I've researched the furnace here in some depth. If there's anything you want to know, just ask away. Like the back of my hand? <laughs> Make no mistake, I have been here a good many times before. Not only that, but I've met people in Inazuma whose families used to live in Tatarasuna years ago. They said it's all true, the history here. Hmm? Oh, well, uh, it's a long story, don't you know? The tale of Tatarasuna starts a long time ago. I'm told that its history is one of the most foremost forging and smelting operations in the nation, goes back around a thousand years. Still, the furnace has had a couple of serious maintenance issues along the way. A couple? When exactly? One was just in the last few years, the other was several hundred years ago. A fun fact, I'm not the first Fontaine tech guy to come and work on it either. There was a guy back then too. They say he was a mechanic who consulted on a technology upgrade. It seems like the technological collaboration between our two nations goes back a long way. How about that? Hey, weren't you gonna ask Xavier something about Tatarasuna? Come on, ask already! Oh, I didn't realize you two were here for a history lesson. Me neither. Paimon doesn't know what's gotten into this one today. Feels like we've been preparing for a history exam or something. Hmm? What brought this on? Did you just wake up today with a sudden burning desire for historical knowledge? Sure, go ahead. A kabuki mono? Hmm, no, I can't say that I have. I do know the word, Inazuman for those eccentric types who always go around dressed to the nines. Just the sort of person that I'd like to meet, actually. But sadly, I've never had the pleasure, nor have I come across anything to do with a kabuki mono where Tatara Suna is concerned. Of course! Don't mention it. We're leaving? Okay, bye, Xavier! Oh, you're most welcome. More than happy to help. Farewell. Looks like you got all the information you're looking for. Sure, but what's up with you today? Whatever it is, it seems like it's really troubling you. Keep your smile, Spinal Crocodile. No matter what happens, Paimon will always be there for you. Hey, don't mention it. <laughs> All right, let's head off and go meet Nahida. It's them! Akaba! Sawada! You're still here? Indeed we are! If you have a moment, we'd love for you to join us once more. We have time. What do you want to talk to us about? It's the same topic we discussed last time. Obviously. Still looking for more info about Tatarasuna, huh? Hmm, should we join them? Unfortunately, we haven't made any real progress. Huh? Oh, uh, of course.
I presume you'll want to read mine as well. Well, what do you think? Hey, Traveler, remember how last time Akaba was saying how you wish you could gather more information about all this? Well, we just got back from Inazuma, so how about we tell them what we learned? What did you find out? Something big? It's a long story. Basically, we have some friends in Inazuma, and... Wow. So many new details. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Well, well. So it all comes down to one man's desire for revenge. Huh. You heard this from a member of the Amanoma clan, you say? Then I guess it must be true. Ugh. So there's no ghost story here after all. This new information actually lends further credence to my hypothesis. Evidently, swordsmiths were seen as having an incredibly prestigious role in society those days, to the extent that harming them was conceived of, at least by the perpetrator, as a way of exacting revenge against those in power. Yes, yes, okay, point taken, you were right. But that doesn't mean I can't carry on with my novel. And they're back at it. These guys are really into this. Oh, so sorry. Look at us, prattling on about our projects and ignoring you. <laughs> Thank you so much for the information. You're welcome. See ya. Keep us in the loop if you find out anything else. Will do. Quite a story. So, uh, this puppet known as the Balladeer erased himself from Ermin's soul, hoping that he could change the past. But how was he even able to do that? As the Traveler said, he very nearly became Sumeru's deity. Admittedly, I remember it a little differently. I don't recall finding anyone inside the machine after we defeated it. Nevertheless, 
It does make sense. If someone were to successfully erase themselves from Ermin's soul, the world would change to reflect the new reality. So, you believe this person really existed, and we just don't remember him because... Well, because he literally changed the world? Yes. Theoretically speaking, it is possible to do this. But I'm struggling to imagine the kind of person who would dare go through with it. The Traveler comes from a world beyond to that. That's why there's no information about her in Ermin's soul. And it also explains why any changes to Ermin's soul wouldn't affect her. So if there's anyone in the world capable of retaining memories from a past that has been rewritten, it's you. It's quite incredible when you think about it. Paimon's having a hard time understanding this Balladeer guy's motivations. Why did he do it? I can only make inferences based on the information we've been given. As for what kind of person he was, only you remember that. Something else worrying you? Something that you can't share? It couldn't change the fate of the ones who had died, right? Once the Balladeer realized he hadn't been betrayed after all, it must have completely changed his view of the people of Tatarasuna. Now he saw them as friends again. He couldn't keep hating humans after that. And if he thought there was a chance he could save his old friends, it would be hard not to try. The story makes sense. Every part of it. The Balladeer tried to achieve godhood with the Doctor's help. He was unsuccessful, but retained the power to connect with Ermansoul. That power then enabled him to change what was recorded in Ermansoul and erase himself, even though he didn't have much strength left. Yeah, it does make sense, but... It still ended in tragedy for his friends. It just feels so hopeless. He gave everything to do this, but... It seems like he got nothing in return. Please wait a moment. I want to check something. Hmm... Found it. This should be the one. It turns out that... I have a strange way of confirming everything she has told us. What is it? A record from a personal collection. It was tucked away in a corner. You should take a look. Is this... a fairy tale? Who wrote it? I authored this record myself. Huh? You... wrote a fairy tale? That somehow has something to do with the Balladeer? When combined with the Traveler's narrative, it's clear that this story is an allegory. Everything in it is a symbol for something else. Hold on. So this record survived from... the... past past? Yes. Any information about the Balladeer or the Kabuki Mono and other records will have been changed. But I wrote this story in a way that means it was left intact. Changing the information in Ermansoul changes to that. But Ermansoul can't change information that was well hidden in advance. I guess I must have written this story as a backup before the Balladeer entered Ermansoul. That's incredible! What a great idea! And sending the Traveler into Ermansoul with the Balladeer must have been a further precaution. I knew she'd remember everything. This story is abstract enough that it still resonates with the present information recorded in Ermansoul. But if we connect all the different pieces together, 
The true story that emerges is the one she told us. The now erased life of the Balladeer. There was once a lone monster draped in fox fur. The monster found a family of foxes, joined them, and they became friends. The monster lived with the family day and night, and everyone treated it as one of their own. Once in a while, the monster would take off its fox fur at night, and lament to itself as it gazed at its reflection in the water. I am a monstrosity, yet they are too foolish to see it. I pity them. But the monster soon found solace when another came to live among the foxes who was not their kin. A kitten, carved from the wood of a white tree who had been abandoned by the humans. The kitten too wished to become a fox, but its tail was too slender and it could not grow a coat of richly colored fur. Yet when the other foxes saw this, they spoke words of comfort to the kitten. Even without a tail and fur like ours, you are still one of us. Furious at this happy resolution, the monster lit a fire on the mountain. The terrified animals panicked as the fire spread. The only way to extinguish the flames was to make a sacrifice. A gray fox stood up and addressed the monster. It said, You are the cleverest among us. Surely you can help us find a way to solve this? The monster smiled, led the fox toward the fire, and murdered it. The gray fox's heart was turned into a beautiful drop of water, clear, spotless, and pure. The monster gave the heart of water to the kitten, telling him, The foxes have decided. You are the one who must be sacrificed. Take this, quench the flames, and die for your fox kin. The fire was extinguished, but the kitten lived. It left that side of the mountain and found a little bird who had a broken wing. The two promised they would spend their whole lives together, but the little bird did not have long left to live. It passed away soon after. After burying the bird, the kitten left the mountain for good. Never again would it cherish a single creature, nor a single blade of grass that stood on that mountain. The kitten spent the nights wandering aimlessly, gnashing its teeth at the moon. How it wished to swallow the moon and devour the moonlight! If the world could only return to darkness, then it would finally be peaceful and content. I will become the new moon, the answer to everything. Then, no one will know that there were once birds, foxes, and cats in this world. And no one can know that they were different. not just the Balladeer story. It is his very own memories. I made a backup so that it would be preserved no matter what happened. To become a god, he was experimented on and modified countless times. It was brutal torture, and the only reason he was able to survive is that he was a puppet. This memory was extracted from him by the scholars. Presumably, they kept it to have something to defend themselves with. Creating a deity was just the first step. Some of them wanted to be able to control it. That's why they backed up his memory for later use. I buried it deep inside one of my own dreams, and then hid it inside an allegorical story so that it wouldn't be altered. It's hard to believe that this person really existed, let alone that he tried to... Get rid of us on more than one occasion! Paimon has no memory of him at all. He completely vanished like a puff of smoke! 
The Balladeer agreed to help me look for information about the Descenders, and although he was unsuccessful, he still helped you. Before he vanished, he confirmed an important detail, that Conria was where your twin first came into this world. We still don't know how the change to Ermin Soul will affect the senior ranks of the Fatui, but in all likelihood, they won't even remember their own harbinger. It sounds like Paimon wouldn't like this guy a whole lot if he was still around. But still, Paimon doesn't like the way it all ended that much better. This is why wisdom alone cannot answer all our questions. We look, we see, and we comprehend. But the question still troubles us. So the answer is not everything. People yearn to find the truth, and then conquer the troubles they face. When you give someone the truth, you give them a chance to choose their own destiny. To others looking on, this may seem like a pointless endeavor, but for him, the chance to act on his desire to disappear must have meant a lot. Never forget that even when we walk beneath dark clouds along a road filled with suffering, the light of wisdom is always there. Guiding us toward a better destination. And that is what you have been doing all along. Yeah, Nahid is right. Cheer up! How about we go get something to eat? We can pick up this heavy conversation again later. Good idea. Paimon, why don't you take her out for a walk to clear her head? You got it! Come on, Traveler! You need to get out of your head for a while. You'll feel much better after taking a walk. Let's go get a snack for one of the stalls in the Grand Bazaar! That'll be sure to lift our spirits! It must be really tough being the only one who remembers all that. But Paimon's always here to help cheer you up. How's everything going with your thesis? I should be able to publish it next month. <sighs> A few days ago, I was worried that I'd have to stop my work on it. Thankfully, that didn't come to pass. Well, Azar was one of your thesis advisors. Honestly, I was afraid that you might have gotten dragged down as well. How did things get settled? 
The newly appointed Acting Grand Sage reviewed all of our projects and gave us permission to continue our research. Acting Grand Sage? That sounds like a new thing. Yeah, I heard that selecting new sages has been taking some time, so he's just filling in. But it's all thanks to him that our research results weren't jeopardized. Once my paper is published, I'm definitely giving myself a long vacation and getting some much-needed rest. Mondstadt sounds like a good idea. They're really out of their minds, making I'll hate them the acting grand sage. Take it easy, Professor. I'm puzzled as well. Just going by qualifications, you're one of our most preeminent scholars. I don't know why they picked a stripling like him. Fool! Do you think I'm angry because I wasn't chosen for the position? No! It's because I don't understand why they chose him! He was one of my students, but he rarely attended class. When I asked him about it, he retorted that self-study was better use of his time. What brazen arrogance! Misery of miseries! For the Academia to have him as the acting Grand Sage? <laughs> <coughs> Professor, don't get so worked up. I'll go get you some water. Psst! Wanna hear a secret? I've heard the new acting Grand Sage is from Haravatat. Really? Who is it? Someone named Alhatham. Never met him myself, but he's a real hot topic right now. Lots of things being said about him. Hard to tell what's true and what isn't, though. There's also a Vahumana scholar who's been in the spotlight recently. They say that he's a likely pick to be one of the next sages. Oh, is he teaching any courses? Maybe we should drop by. Wow, news of Alhatham being the acting Grand Sage sure spread fast. Some people don't know who he is, though. Guess he's less famous than Paimon Dot. Some people are saying good things, and others bad. Especially that old guy just now. He really doesn't like all Haytham. Uh... Hey! Are you okay? Uh, you don't look too good. The Matra. The Matra? I'm Ilias. I have to talk to Amatra about something important. In the state you're in? You shouldn't push yourself. Why don't you tell us what happened and we'll pass on your message to Amatra? No, I have to tell them myself. They are the only ones I could trust. Sorry, can you lend me your arm? This is an important matter. Failure is not an option. Since you put it that way, fine. We'll take you to Amatra. We promised to take him to Amatra, but we don't know that many, do we? Oh, wait! Sino should be back at the Academia! Let's go find him!
shopping list. Oh, what a mouth-watering smell. Paima would know the aroma of biryani anywhere. Let's go get some. Uh, we can still add it to the list. Well, if it isn't the Traveler and Paimon. Wasn't expecting to see you here. <sighs> Hello there. Oh, it's been quite a while. Huh, so you two are still hanging out together. Dia, didn't you say last time that you were gonna head back to the desert? <laughs> I said I was going to resign from being her bodyguard. Not that our friendship was over. We're still the best of friends. The Homayanis also still post jobs from time to time. Their pay is always generous, so me and the other mercs never pass them up. I told Dia to just stay at our place when she took one of those jobs a few days ago. My parents were delighted. They even said that it always felt like we were missing someone whenever Dia wasn't around. <laughs> that sounds like something they would say, all right. They're always so welcoming. Anyway, the job is already taken care of, so I was gonna head back to the brigade as soon as I finished a little shopping. But the master kept insisting, and I ended up staying for another day. You can stay for as many days as you want, Dia. Father hasn't even gotten around to treating you to his best dishes yet. <laughs> you know I'm not the kind of person to stay put in one place like that, my lady. Don't worry, though. There'll always be next time. What? She said they'll treat you to the best dishes! I can't believe you can still refuse that! <sighs> but, but wait! Didn't you say last time that you would take me on a trip to the desert? Why don't there are so many places I still haven't visited yet? I'm sorry, my lady, but no can do. There are still a few things I need to take care of back at the brigade. Besides, the desert hasn't exactly been the most peaceful place lately. Oh, come on. Not this again. That's also what you said last time and the time before that. I know, I'm sorry. Just give me some more time, and I promise I'll plan the best trip ever for you. All right, fine. To be perfectly honest, it's not that I wanted to go, it's more like... I feel like something is off about you lately. Ever since you first set foot on the estate a few days ago, you've been acting anxious and even paranoid. Have you been delaying our trip because you've run into some kind of trouble? N nah, are you kidding? You're worrying too much. Would you swear on that? Friends shouldn't lie to each other, you know. I wouldn't pry any further if you're willing to swear on what you just said. But if something really is bothering you, then just tell me. You know I'll help you however I can. Mm. Oh, looks like Junior Zad was onto something. You're too perceptive, my lady. Seems I can't hide anything from you. I just thought that nothing good could come out of telling you about the messy happenings of mercenaries. Knowing too much only leads to more trouble. Mercenary life is a dog-eat-dog -dog world where Mora reigns supreme. Everything operates on a completely different set of rules. That doesn't change anything about what I just said, though. We're still friends, and I can only support you if I understand what's bothering you. My lady... You're not gonna stop until you drag it out of me, are ya? All right, I'll share what I know. Let's go somewhere else first. This isn't exactly the best place for a discussion. Okay, let's talk here. Just try not to draw any extra attention. As you may already know, the Eremites have both a lot of mercenaries and a complex organizational structure. Many mercs are no different than me just going around looking for jobs to earn some mora. My brigade is called the Blazing Beasts. We're not a large group, but every member is loyal and brave. However, not all Aramite brigades are like mine. Some are willing to cross all kinds of lines for the sake of mora. The most notorious is a faction known as Deshret's Relics. Deshret's Relics? Judging from the name, they must really look up to... Yep, you got it. I've heard that you've already crossed paths with Ain al Akmar. They're one of the groups under the Relic's banner. Oh, you mean the group that tried to sell us the Divine Knowledge Capsule? Yeah, they weren't friendly at all. Deshret's Relics is composed of many smaller brigades like Ain al Akmar. 
The Relic's headquarters issues orders to all brigades under his control. On any other day, I would want nothing to do with them. Unfortunately, though, the brigade that's stirring up trouble now is none other than Dakan al Akmar. Dakan? Uh, I think it means beard or something. Believe me, it's a really stupid name. I found it insufferable for years. Anyway, the real issue is that Dakan al Akmar is led by my father, Kusela. Say what now? I think I'm starting to understand your anxiety now. But what did they do? I won't go into details, my lady. But they've been involved in a lot of violent incidents. We're talking hundreds. Hundreds? Yep. The scenes tend to be quite gruesome, too. They strip the victims of all their valuables before murdering them. Not only have they targeted merchant caravans and ordinary citizens, but other mercenary brigades as well. That's beyond terrible. They won't even spare their own kind. I don't know how Deshret's relic sees it. All I do know is that Dakan al-Akmar has become more and more aggressive over the last few years. If I don't do something about them, then even my brigade or the people of Aru village could become their next target. I just wish I knew what's driven him to do this. Yeah. How can your father do such terrible things? I don't know. People change. He's always been pretty pathetic. But at least in the past, there were still a few lines that he wouldn't cross. That's setting the bar pretty low. I mean, if he was even remotely decent, then why would I have to leave the brigade and cut all ties with him? He was loud and foolish, with no real sense of purpose. Instead of doing anything useful, he spent most of his time drinking and chasing after women. Of course, the other brigade members were just like him. Their ruckus would go on night after night. Sounds like a nightmare. What about your mother? Did she ever step in to stop them? Unfortunately, I never knew my mother. Uh, oh, um, I'm sorry, Dia. I, I didn't know. It's all right, my lady. That's pretty common in mercenary circles. Didn't I mention that my father was chasing after women? I was the result of one of those encounters with some random person. He told me that he wasn't sure who my mother was. And in any case, she never came to see me. He'd say, you'll be fine as long as you remember to stick with dad. But even then, he left most of the parenting to the brigade. The one thing I do remember is that he used to tell me stories. But the problem was that he had terrible taste. He only knew a few stories, and even those tended to be pretty stale. They were tales of desert warriors defeating dragons in the forest, or stories of mercenaries rescuing princesses from rebel armies. Sounds like your typical fairy tales. More or less, yeah. They were interesting maybe the first or second time around, but after about 20 repeats, they started to get a little dull. He seemed to think those stories were the best things ever, though. He was so into them that he'd call the whole brigade over and make them perform the whole thing as a play. Even the toys he gave me would all be story props. I'd get helmets, shields, and toy swords. It was only much later when I realized that the shows were more for him than they ever were for me. What in... Interesting guy. Yeah, I've always found him pretty childish, but that was something I could just shrug off. I had no reason to despise him. Until I grew up and learned the true face of Deshret's relics for myself. Looting, blackmail, violence, and fraud. They not only accepted such heinous acts, they would even openly boast about them. No one in the brigade was any kind of hero. Instead, my father and his cronies were more like the bad guys that needed to be taken down. Did they really think that as long as they didn't do any of that stuff right in front of me, I would never know? I think I can understand your feelings. The difference between perception and reality must have hit hard. Yeah, but don't worry, my lady. It's all water under the bridge to me now. I had a huge argument with my father and left that place behind for good. I'm not investigating them due to any bitter feelings I still have towards my father. I just want to protect those that are close to me. 
Yeah. I told the boys to gather as much information as they could. Most of the reports concern violent incidents, but there's also some talk of smuggling. I see. Uh, but isn't this investigation incredibly dangerous? It is, but every mercenary lives life on the edge. It's a lifestyle that I enjoy. That may be true, but it'll be impossible for those who care about you not to worry. Well, now you get why I didn't want to share any of this with you. What should we do? They both have valid concerns. Huh? But there's no need for you to get caught up in this mess, too. Well, she's super tough, so if she went into the desert with you, then Paimon bets the problem will be solved in no time. <clears throat> I'm inclined to agree. I'd feel a lot more at ease if you took her along to help. I'll wait for news from you in the city until then. Please, stay safe. Hmm. I'm honored that you care so much for me, my lady. All right, then let's get moving. Our first stop will be Caravan Rebot, where we can catch up a bit with my fellow mercs. Please be careful. I'll stay and just don't do anything reckless. Hello and welcome everyone. I am Safwan, a scholar from the Academia, and I will serve as this debate's adjudicator. I swear to judge both parties with the utmost wisdom and impartiality. I will neither interfere with the proceedings, nor demonstrate bias. I ask for both parties to stand. May the Dendro Archon also serve as a witness to this duel of wits. Since you so desperately demand an explanation, I will expound on the Academia's stance. You may have misunderstood us from the outset, and believe that the Academia is prejudiced against you. However, the truth is that the Academia wishes for every resident of Sumeru to be afforded opportunities to grow and cultivate their wisdom. Therefore, the works they consume should also possess enlightening qualities and intellectual value. We have failed to identify these qualities in the shows performed at Zubair Theater. In other words, instead of struggling against the Academia in pointless confrontations, if you had spent your time reflecting on improving the quality of your shows and enlightening your audience, Zubair Theater would not be today facing such a tragic fate. Aggressive from the get-go, he's really putting on the pressure. Can Nilu stand her ground? Calm down, Nilu. First, carefully analyze what he said. He said that we were shut down not because the Academia looks down on the arts, but rather because our shows aren't up to their standards. The most important thing about an experience is how you choose to interpret it. Art must first be appreciated by others to confer value. Mr. Zubair has been meticulously managing the theater. Everything checks out. Everyone is free to appreciate art. No form of art is inherently superior. Inaya really wants to win. She doesn't want to lose anything else because of her painful past. The theater carries everyone's feelings and serves as the bond that connects us all. In your eyes, our shows can't meet the Academia's expectations. Shouldn't it be the audience who decides if a show is intellectual or enlightening? Why is someone from the Academia judging that? Also, I believe that there is no such thing as a wiser or more enlightening performance. Art doesn't discriminate, and it appeals to all. Everyone has the right to appreciate art. Appreciation is but a primitive form of satisfaction. Guidance and enlightenment are necessary if we are to induce growth in the performers as well as the audience. This stance holds performers to a higher standard and encourages the development of the arts. 
If all performances are simple-minded, require little effort to comprehend, and lack any impetus for the betterment of society, then the people will not be able to develop a greater level of artistic understanding. Nurturing the populace's understanding requires a long and arduous process, and guiding this process is the Academia's true goal. He changed the topic without patting an eye. Good thing I'm prepared. If I remember correctly, what I should say here is... The most important thing about an experience is how you choose to interpret it. No, 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 no. Art must first be appreciated by... Someone at our theater has tried that before. He was a famed artist, but he recognized that very few people could connect with his works. I agree that art should be enlightening, but we can't pursue that goal by creating complicated works. If a work can't tap into an audience's personal experiences or feelings, then its contents may as well be a castle in the sky. What's the point of performing a show that its audience can't even follow? That would only be forcing people to watch something they don't like. You can only reach that conclusion from a place of ignorance. In that case, before passing judgment, you should first become a better dancer than me. You tell them, Nilu. Looks like he's backed himself into a corner. As the party holding the burden of proof, Sharif has failed to provide sufficient support for his judgment of the quality of Zubair Theater's programs. Likewise, the definition that Nilu put forth is but her personal opinion. Neither party is the victor for this particular point of contention. Additionally, I must request that both parties exercise greater control on their emotions. Keep it up, Nilu! You're doing great! In that case, I shall speak of more concrete matters. The essence of this issue is that you have violated the law, so you must now pay the price for your transgression. This course of action is also completely procedurally sound. We have already contacted Zubair Theater multiple times regarding the theater's repertoire. However, you have consciously ignored our warnings, or perhaps your compliance was purely superficial. Regardless, that failure has indirectly led to the present day's proceedings. That is indeed so, according to the laws decreed by the Academia. He started talking about procedural stuff? So I need to focus on... The most important thing about an experience... Mr. Zubair has been meticulously managing the theater. Mr. Zubair has already provided signed copies of all documentation related to our operations. Everything is perfectly filled out and valid. Although the theater's performances don't align with the Academia's requests, the law doesn't say that Zubair Theater can be demolished only because of that reason. Demolition notices need to be provided in writing and made available to the public. Otherwise, the theater can continue to operate as long as its license is valid. Failing to follow these rules makes your stance procedurally unsound. Yeah! Yeah! That's right! There are different ways to apply the rules. There is precedent for this. So long as this matter is discussed within the Academia, this course of action will come to pass. Looking at the past 27 cases of similar nature, 90% of them support Sharif's claim and position. However, the demolition process in those cases was only started after discussion at the Academia. In other words, premature notice of demolition is indeed a rash act. That's more than enough. We've proven that the order is unreasonable as it currently stands. <laughs> Cease your futile resistance. Nilu's definitely won this point, right? You're right. Stay focused, Nilu. Even if permission for demolition has yet to be obtained, it is a fact that your performances violated the Academia's policies on numerous occasions. Based on that fact, we can permanently revoke your right to perform in Sumeru. Uh under the current system, it is indeed possible to immediately revoke Zubair Theater's performing rights. That's a thing? 
Rather than protecting Zubair Theater, I surmise that your true intention is to maintain your hold over your audience and their patronage as your source of income. Without them, Zubair Theater is nothing more than an empty building. And without its performances, the theater has nothing else of value. What you said isn't true at all. <sighs> Keep it cool, Milu. Right. I need to keep calm, but he... just a little more. Zubair Theater isn't just a performance venue to us. Mr. Zubair has been meticulous. Inaya really wants to win. She doesn't want to lose... The theater carries everyone's feelings, and... Zubair Theater isn't simply a performance venue to us. It means more than that. It's been our home for a long time. Miss Raycar can't go on adventures anymore, but she has found a stable career and a new life at the theater. Her son, Soarin, has already passed his theater exam, and he'll soon be our newest member. Mr. Kasani found a new way to look at art. He decided to stay at the theater to watch us grow. Mr. Farhad and Mr. Hushong visit even when there isn't a show going on, and they always tell us lots of entertaining stories. Even Inaya wants to stay with us, and she's starting to look forward to a new future. Zubair Theater exists for them, for every single one of us. Perhaps Zubair Theater has provided you with a multitude of positive emotions and experiences. However, you have misconstrued something, young miss. The interpersonal relationships you speak of were established upon normal theater operations. Sheikh Zubair operates the theater for his livelihood. His employees work for their wages, and the audience comes to enjoy performances. Relationships are merely a byproduct in this exchange of interests. They may be pleasant and captivating, but they can only ever be secondary. When scholars collaborate to solve difficult problems, we freely share our knowledge and resources with one another as if we were all kin. However, this collaboration ends after the results of our work are published. The reason is simple. We are scholars, and there are new projects that await our attention. He really doesn't think much of relationships. Paimon also thinks he did a lot of prep. He's been solid as a rock! Sharif's argument is currently the more persuasive of the two for this point of contention. The continuance of the interpersonal relationships Nilu spoke of remains hypothetical before the theater's demolition, whereas the situation that Sharif described has been well documented at the Academia. The Academia has made significant academic contributions, in no small part due to its researchers' efficiency and ability to compartmentalize. Oh no! What should we do? Things are going in the opposite direction! A setup? So Nilu's got him? Good. He said what he said. The next argument could decide this debate. But... Is this really the best thing to do? It might be too cruel to Inaya. She already agreed to this. She wants to win, no matter what. Me too. Mr. Sharif believes that interpersonal relationships are a byproduct of working towards a goal. Once that goal is achieved or abandoned, those relationships would have no more reason to continue. Then, if someone has failed to live up to his expectations... If someone has failed to live up to your expectations and ran away from home... Then she shouldn't be your daughter anymore. Right? Inaya... Sorry, Nilu. As expected, I should be the one to say it. You don't need to shoulder this responsibility for me. Uh, <laughs> if in your eyes, the purpose of my existence is to become your academic successor, then that goal has ended in complete failure. By your logic, that means there is no more reason to sustain our relationship as father and daughter. Members of the audience who do not belong to either debate party, please speak with caution. Let her speak. What she does not say, Nilu will. No matter how many disagreements we've had, 
The truth is that you are still my father. You're so immersed in your own world, you can't understand why we come together for the sake of relationships. Yeah, don't look down on us. You can watch a dance anywhere, but there's only one Zubair Theater. I'm almost starting to feel sorry for this guy, what with the idiotic things he said. Order, order! Members of the audience, do not interrupt debate proceedings. I confess that this is the final argument we had prepared. Disown me, and you will win the debate. But before that, Father, I have some final words to say. I've been doing some soul-searching. Not about whether I should have run away from home, but whether there was any point to my personal rebellion against you. I kept trying to earn your approval, but I only disappointed you over and over. The truth is, I ran away from home as a means to vent my recurring frustrations. That is to say, I was exerting pressure on you and hoping you'd give up on your lofty expectations. But by doing that, wasn't I just doing the same thing as you? Uh. <sighs> I won't force my expectations upon you anymore. At Zubair Theater, I have found the life I've always wanted. I will move on from my family troubles and strive towards my new goal. But if you dare, to harm this place, then I will stand with my friends here and fight against you. This is not the time to space out, Sharif. The debate is still underway. You already consider them to be your friends. You should be asking us that question. Of course we are. Miss Inaya is a really good friend. It was a bit of a process, but we won her over. Make no mistake, all those who come to Zubair Theater become one of us. We will always be with her. <laughs> Such puerile simplicity. However... It is surprisingly a relief. Wait, what are you... Ah, uh, never mind. They... left? Does that mean we've won? We won? Neo! You're amazing! <sighs> I relaxed for a moment and... I feel a little faint. It looks like he still has a place for her in his heart. Terrific work, Nilu and Anaya! They likely won't cause any more trouble for us. Didn't know you could get so fierce. I have a lot of newfound respect for you two. Uh, this really took a lot out of me, though. <sighs> I don't ever want to do this again. Both Miss Nilu and Miss Inaya were so cool! Should we throw a second round of celebrations? <laughs>